And I'd like to say uh, welcome to QSA's um, QSA Talks online. My name is David Patterson and we are proud to present our QSA Talk, Offenders, Paupers and Pioneers, Convict Women and Their Families in Pre-Separation Queensland. And before we begin, I would like to respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which this event is taking place, the Yagara and Terrible Peoples, and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. And I would like to welcome our special guest, Jan Richardson. Queensland State Archives is partnering with Griffith University to host the 2020 Visiting Fellows Seminar Series. The seminars in this series are presented by Visiting Fellows attached to the Harry Gentle Resource Centre of Griffith University. And it's a great opportunity to see how historians use QSA records to further their research. Today we'll be hearing, from a, hearing a presentation from Jan Richardson who will discuss her research on female convicts and ex-convicts who arrived in Moreton Bay after the closure of the penal settlement in 1839. Her current project comprises a more extensive examination of historical and genealogical records, including photographs, family trees and cemetery records, to reconstruct the lives of these women, many of whom married ex-convict husbands and raised families during Moreton Bay's earliest years of free settlement. And now I will hand you over to Jen. Good morning and welcome to the Queensland State Archives and today's presentation, Offenders, Paupers and Pioneers, Convict Women and Their Families and Pre-Separation Queensland. I would also like to acknowledge that we are gathered on the lands of the Yugara and Turrbal peoples and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Long before European explorers, convicts, the military and civil administrators began arriving in Moreton Bay in the 1820s, Indigenous peoples lived on these lands. There are many documented interactions between male convicts who absconded from the penal settlement and the Aborigines they interacted or lived with, one of whom I will mention today. However, as my presentation concentrates on female convicts who lived in Moreton Bay during the 1800s, whose interactions with the region's traditional owners is far less well documented, I will only make brief references to Indigenous Australians present at that time. In 1980, Harry Gentle enrolled as a mature age student at Griffith University, graduating with a Bachelor of Arts in April 1984. In 2015, he left a generous bequest to the university to support the ongoing study of early Australian history. As a result of that bequest, Griffith University established the Harry Gentle Resource Centre to assist and facilitate research on social, economic, political, indigenous and environmental histories through innovative digital approaches. Griffith University is thankful to Harry and the Gentle family for their support. I applied for a Harry Gentle Resource Centre Visiting Fellowship because I am passionate about recovering and telling the stories of convicts and ex-convicts who came to live in Queensland after the closure of the penal settlement in 1839. My particular interests are female convicts, as well as those who are non-European, including African, Indian, and a small number of Aboriginal convicts and prisoners sent to Moreton Bay. I recently completed a Master of Philosophy thesis through the University of New England titled Shapeshifters and Identity Switches, Female Convicts in Free Settlement Queensland. I am also a keen genealogist and have been researching my family history for many years. I'm particularly interested in the intersection between academic and genealogical research. How historians and genealogists can learn from each other. How family historians are contributing to a growing collection of what are known as micro-narratives or small stories often of ordinary non-elite people and how the overarching narratives and rigorous methods used by academic researchers can strengthen genealogical research and allow descendants to view the broader picture which transforms a family tree comprised of names and dates into a true family history in which each step makes sense through an understanding of the events, forces and attitudes of the time in which they lived. 
The Moreton Bay Penal Settlement was closed in 1839 and the district opened to free settlement in February 1842. Over the next 10 years, more than 2,000 convicts and ex-convicts arrived in the district from New South Wales and Van Diemen's Land. We know this because the 1851 New South Wales Census of the Northern Districts, encompassing Brisbane and Ipswich, west to the Darling Downs and as far north as Maryborough, recorded about 5,700 adults aged 21 and over. The census divided residents into free and bond. Those who were bond, and therefore still serving their convict sentences, were divided into holding tickets of leave, in government employment, and in private service. Those who were free were further categorised as born in the colony or arrived free, or alternatively, as other free persons. However, other free persons were in fact ex-convicts who had only acquired their freedom after arriving in Australia. Adding together 650 men and women in the bond category and nearly 1,500 in the other free persons category, we find that there were 2,224 convicts and ex-convicts in Queensland in 1851, comprising 39% of all adults. However, of these, only 107 were women. 105 were ex-convicts and two were still serving a convict sentence. 70 women were living in Stanley, which encompassed Brisbane and Ipswich. Four were in the wider Moreton Bay area, 24 on the Darling Downs, six in Wide Bay, two in the Burnett District and one in the Maranoa. Together, these 107 women comprised less than 0.05% of Queensland's 2,224 convicts and ex-convicts. The remaining 99.95% were male. In my master's thesis, I identified about 50 convict and ex-convict women with links to Moreton Bay prior to the district separating from New South Wales to become the colony of Queensland in 1859. Of these, I established that 10 departed the region or died prior to the 1851 census. One of these 10 women was Sarah Davis, transported on the Burrell in 1832, who married one of Moreton Bay's earliest settlers, John Williams. She died in Brisbane in 1849. Her brief death notice, simply referring to her as Sarah, the beloved wife of Mr John Williams, licensed victualler, aged 52 years, makes no mention of her convict past. The death or departure of these 10 women means that only 40 of the 50 women I have identified could have been counted in the 1851 census. That leaves at least 67 of the 107 women yet to be located and I am very much hoping to discover some of their names and stories throughout the course of my fellowship. Convict and ex-convict women were often accompanied to Queensland by their ex-convict husbands and children. Some women re-offended and were sent to jail. Some fell into poverty and were admitted to a benevolent asylum as a pauper, while others blended in with the thousands of free arrivals, becoming part of Queensland's pioneer narrative. In my thesis, I contend that the contribution of these women and their families to the transformation of Moreton Bay from a penal settlement in 1839 to the newly established colony of Queensland in 1859 has long been neglected. With the exception of Hannah Rigby, whose story I will come to shortly, Queensland histories have concentrated on the male convicts of Moreton Bay and later ex-convicts who were considered notable or successful during the Free Settlement era. To cite just a few examples, the Scottish convict James Davis, also known as Durham Boy, was transported to Sydney on the ship Norfolk in 1825 and then to Moreton Bay in 1829. A celebrated runaway, he lived for 13 years with Pamby Pamby, an Aboriginal chief who believed that Davis was his dead son returned to life. 
Davis surrendered himself to the authorities in 1842 and remained in the district working as an Aboriginal interpreter. He maintained contact with the son he had with his Aboriginal wife, but was married twice after returning to Brisbane in 1842. His second wife, Bridget Hayes, was charged with his manslaughter in 1889. Another well-known convict is Thomas Douse, who was transported to New South Wales in 1828. He arrived in, Br in Brisbane as a freed or emancipated convict in July 1842, just five months after the district opened to free settlement. Douse put his hand to many different roles over the years, including ferry owner, auctioneer, correspondent for the Sydney Morning Herald and Moreton Bay Courier, and Brisbane Town Clerk. Through the research of Dr Jennifer Harrison on the 144 female convicts who served colonial sentences at Moreton Bay, we know that Hannah was married to the convict George Page, who was transported to Moreton Bay in 1826. In 1830, Hannah, by now mother to two young sons, was herself transported to Moreton Bay for stealing 30 yards of ribbon. Hannah's third son, James Rigby, known as Jimmy, was born at the penal settlement in September 1832. However, Harrison's research has revealed that his father was not George Page, who was still at Moreton Bay, but the boat pilot at Stradbroke Island, James Hexton, a free arrival formerly of the British Navy. After seven years at Moreton Bay, Hannah departed for Sydney in February 1837, leaving Jimmy behind with his father. She then stole two hats and, whether by design or accident, was transported back to Moreton Bay in October 1837, where she was reunited with her son. Many years later, Jimmy, who had taken his father's surname of Hexton, related his memories of the penal settlement prior to its closure in 1839, telling the Queenslander newspaper in 1909 that all the prisoners worked in chains and that he was often asked by a poor wretch to procure from his mother a piece of rag to bind around his ankles to prevent the iron rings from cutting into the flesh. Jimmy also said that the convict women, like the men, had to perform hard outdoor labour in the field or farm or at fencing, and that he had met female convicts when accompanying Dr Ballow, the colonial assistant surgeon, on his fortnightly rounds to the female factory. When the penal settlement was disbanded, Hannah was one of five female convicts chosen to remain as assigned servants during what has become known as the wind-down period between 1839 and 1842. She was employed in the service of Dr Ballow, who recommended her for a certificate of freedom in July 1840. Eleven years later, in April 1851, the boat pilot James Hexton drowned when his vessel capsized in rough seas on his way back from Cape Horn. Hannah died in Brisbane in October 1853 from apoplexy, likely a stroke, after attending a neighbour's wedding festivities. She was buried at the site of the original St John's Church on the western side of Queen Street near the corner of George Street. During the penal era, this was the site of the convict lumber yard and workshop. In 1842, the Church of England converted the workshop into St John's Church. Unfortunately, the building was demolished in 1902 and the Treasury Hotel and Casino is now located on the site. While there is no known photograph of Hannah Rigby, there are several documents acknowledging her presence in Queensland after 1839, including Jimmy Hexton's death certificate, which names his parents as James Hexton, pilot, and Hannah Rigby. In addition, as mentioned earlier, Jimmy's childhood reminiscences of convict days and memories of his mother were published in the Queenslander newspaper in 1909. And when Jimmy died in 1914, the Brisbane Courier published his photograph under the heading, The Oldest White Native. But what of the other women who came to Moreton Bay after the penal settlement closed in 1839? 
To repurpose the phrase so memorably coined by historian Tamsin O'Connor, the stories of Queensland's female convicts have, for the most part, been relegated to a zone of silence. So how do we go about locating the first evidence of their presence in Queensland? Using a combination of archival and digital records, I discovered female convicts and ex-convicts in Moreton Bay's convict, court, jail and benevolent asylum records. Others were first located in academic and local histories, and I have been very fortunate to have made contact with descendants of female convicts who have generously shared their research with me. Perhaps rather obviously, the first group of records I consulted were convict records, including digital images of the Moreton Bay Book of Trials covering July 1838 to February 1842, available on the QSA website, as well as convict tickets of leave and convict applications to marry, which have been digitised by New South Wales State Archives. One of the women identified through these records is Jane Appleyard, who arrived in Sydney on the Mary in 1835. In 1837, Jane was reported as a runaway from her assigned employer in Sydney. Evidence was given that Jane was in an advanced state of pregnancy and had for weeks past given herself up to melancholy and been frequently found in retired parts of the house crying the reason for which she would not disclose. Sent to the Parramatta female factory, she had a baby boy, Thomas, but he died aged five months. Three years later, in August 1840, Jane re-entered the female factory to serve a 12-month sentence with hard labour, the last three weeks in solitary confinement for forging an order. In June 1841, near the end of her sentence, Jane's one-year-old daughter, Rose, died at the factory and was buried at Parramatta. Jane was then sent to Moreton Bay as an assigned servant to Andrew Petrie, the foreman of works. She was charged with being drunk and disorderly at her employer's house on the 28th of February, 1842, just over two weeks after the district opened to free settlement. Jane was returned to Parramatta yet again to serve another two months imprisonment at the female factory. The following year, she earned her certificate of freedom and in 1848, in Wellington, New South Wales, the 32-year-old ex-convict married ticket of leave holder John Kay. Jane died in 1876, aged 60 years, and John Kay died in 1880, aged 66 years. Both are buried at Millthorpe Cemetery in New South Wales. Not only is there a photograph of Jane Appleyard and her husband John Kay, but I am in contact with descendant Barry Lance and his wife Lorraine, who have gone to great lengths to track down Jane's life story. Through visiting the archives and other sites in York where Jane was born, they discovered that she was an illegitimate child and was educated at the Grey Coat School, a charitable school which prepared orphaned girls for domestic service. In 1834, Jane, aged 18, was arrested for stealing a tobacco box containing two five-pound notes. As she had previously served time in jail, she was sentenced to seven years transportation. Despite her difficult start in life and the deaths of her first two children, Thomas and Rose, at the Parramatta Female Factory, as well as being sent to Moreton Bay in 1841, she persevered, married the ex-convict John Kay, and raised a large family in New South Wales, which is very proud of their convict heritage and actively seeking further recognition of Jane's remarkable story, including her time at Moreton Bay prior to the commencement of free settlement. The next category of women I searched for were convicts granted tickets of leave or permission to marry in Moreton Bay. Only one woman received both. Mary Langley was tried in England in March 1840 for feloniously making on the 12th of February three pieces of counterfeit coin intended to resemble and pass for three of the Queen's current coin called sixpences. Sentenced to 10 years transportation, the 34-year-old Langley arrived in Sydney on the ship Surrey in 1840. 
In September 1845, she obtained a ticket of leave for Moreton Bay. Just six weeks later, aged 39, Mary Langley applied to marry ticket of leave man Henry Skinner, aged 51, a convict transported on the Lady Kennaway. They were married by the Reverend John Gregor in Brisbane on the 19th of December 1845, possibly the first and only marriage of a female ticket of leave holder in Queensland. Henry Skinner arrived in Moreton Bay in October 1839 as one of the prisoners sent north to maintain the settlement's buildings and other assets during the wind down period. He chose to remain and was granted a ticket of leave for Moreton Bay in April 1842, so was already here when Mary Langley was granted her ticket in 1845. The Skinners had one son, Thomas, born in Brisbane in 1850 when Mary was about 44 years old. Henry died in 1864, aged about 70. His estate consisted of cattle, stock in trade, an allotment on the corner of George and Turbot Streets on which there was a cottage, a smithy and the Western Railway Hotel, a paddock at Milton, land at Inogra and a residence at Milton. So clearly the ex-convict couple had done well during their years in Queensland. Mary died in 1878, aged 72 years, and was buried at the Tawong Cemetery. Unlike Kevin Izzard O'Doherty's elaborate memorial, Mary Skinner's headstone has long since disappeared, and all that remains is a bare plot covered in leaves. Early court records for Brisbane and Ipswich are very patchy for the 1840s, and some of the women located in these registers were only present in the district for a short period or cannot be traced in Queensland after their court appearances. However, jail records have proved a fruitful avenue of research. The first admissions register of the Brisbane jail covers a 14 year period from January 1850 to February 1864, including the 10 years that the jail was located in the old female factory on Queen Street, now the site of the Brisbane GPO. The admissions register recorded each inmate's ship, year, native place, religion and trade or calling. In addition, the condition of convicts and ex-convicts was described using terms including bond for those who stayed in the colony as, sorry, who arrived in the colony as convicts or who were still serving their original sentence, T of L for ticket of leave holders and F by S for those who were free by servitude. Of the 4,500 admissions between 1850 and 1864, only 446, or about 10%, were female. 375 female admissions were for free women, most of whom arrived on emigrant ships sailing to New South Wales or directly to Moreton Bay. Others were born free in Australia or described as Aboriginal or dangerous lunatics. The remaining 71 admissions related to 22 women described as bond, ticket of leave or free by servitude, or who my research has confirmed as having been transported as a convict. In total, female convicts and ex-convicts only accounted for 15% of all sentences served by women and 1.6% of total jail sentences served by women and men between 1850 and 1864. In this image from 1859, the top entry highlighted in orange belongs to Margaret Banton, who arrived free on the Lascar in 1841. The second entry in blue is for Edward Jones, and the third entry in green is for Mary Allen, both ex-convicts described as bond on arrival in the colonies and free by S, or free by servitude, on entering jail. Another woman described as Bond was Mary Broom, who served six sentences in the Brisbane jail between 1852 and 1855, giving her ship and year of arrival as the Margaret in 1837. There was no woman named Mary Broom on this vessel. However, there was a Margaret Corcoran, and she married Stephen Broom in Newcastle in 1840. The register of convicts' applications to marry reveals that Stephen Broom was also a convict, transported to New South Wales on the Claudine in 1829. 
Also on board were Stephen's two younger brothers. Stephen, aged 21, James, aged 18, and Charles, aged 16, were sentenced of the same offence, stealing two bottles of grape wine, and all were sentenced to death. However, they were reprieved and sent to a hulk at Devonport in May 1829. Unfortunately, there was no happy ending, as the youngest brother Charles, by now 17, died on board the Claudine and never made it to Sydney. The ship's surgeon, William Trotman, initially described Charles' complaint as a cold, but later wrote that he had an inflammation of the mucous membranes of the throat, stomach and intestines. Trotman added that if he had bled him more, instead of concentrating on the pulse, he might have saved him. Just over 10 years after arriving in the colonies in mid-1841, Stephen and James Broom, who had tickets of leave for Newcastle and Maitland, were both granted a ticket of leave passport, which allowed them to proceed to the Darling Downs in the service of Mr John Eels for 12 months. James received another 12-month passport for the Darling Downs in July 1842, but I haven't been able to locate an extension for Stephen. Nevertheless, the brothers were among the first convicts permitted in the district, even before free settlement commenced in February 1842. Perhaps they remained working on the Darling Downs until Stephen's wife Mary was also able to move north. The first evidence of Mary's presence at Moreton Bay is her 1843 Certificate of Freedom, which was notated Brisbane, 29 December, in the margin. Queensland's newspapers regularly recorded the presence of Stephen, Mary and James Broom. In 1848, a neighbour complained that for the past five years, Mary had frequently annoyed the South Brisbane neighbourhood with her turbulent conduct while in a state of intoxication. In 1849, she was referred to as an old familiar face who exhibited a melancholy and disgusting example of habitual drunkenness. And in 1849 and 1853, Stephen Broom took out advertisements cautioning the public not to harbour nor give credit to my wife, Mary Broom. She also appeared before the Brisbane Court of Petty Sessions in June 1854, charged with drunkenness and was fined five shillings. However, perhaps there is more to this story, as in 1852, James Broom was fined three pounds for maltreating Mary Broom, his sister-in-law. In addition, we learn from Mary's death certificate that five of her ten children died young, including the last Anne, who was born prematurely and died at Ipswich in September 1860. Mary, who was about 41 years old, died three days later of inflammation after childbirth. Stephen and his brother James became farmers near Ipswich and they died in 1880 and 1889, both aged in their 70s. They left their farms to Stephen and Mary's eldest daughter, Elizabeth Broom, who remained unmarried and looked after her father and then her uncle in their final years. Like the convict and ex-convict women who were incarcerated in the Brisbane jail, those who ended their days as paupers at the Dunwich Benevolent Asylum on Stradbroke Island were described in the admissions register as bond, or the ship and year of arrival they gave matched a known convict vessel. In contrast to the jail registers, however, the Dunwich records provide a veritable treasure trove of information about female ex-convicts, including the names of their father and mother, thereby revealing the maiden name under which they were generally transported, along with the details of husbands and children. In addition, a section titled History could include other valuable biographical data, including details of convict assignments, employers, places of residence, travels around the colony, and health and financial information. This wealth of genealogical detail allowed me to match Jane Perryman daughter of John Doyle and Teresa McFarm, who was admitted to the Dunwich Benevolent Asylum in 1881, with Jane Doyle, who received a ticket of leave for Moreton Bay in 1844. Doyle, a 19-year-old kitchen maid, was tried at the Lancaster Quarter Sessions and transported in 1838 for picking pockets. 
In November 1840, Jane was granted permission to marry John Perryman, a free immigrant who arrived on the whaling ship Alert. Four years later, she received her ticket of leave and the Perrymans moved to Moreton Bay. In 1846, John Perryman received a licence to operate the Bush Inn, a public house at Cunningham's Gap on the range between Ipswich and Toowoomba. However, in 1850, the Bush Inn was advertised for sale and in 1851, Perryman wrote to the Moreton Bay Courier recommending that others not break up a home to travel to the Turon Goldfields near Cephala, New South Wales, for it is a lottery, he said, and very hard work. There is little trace of the couple for the next 30 years until 61-year-old Jane Perryman was admitted to the Dunwich Benevolent Asylum in 1881, less than a week after her husband, whom the register described as having been paralysed for the last eight years. John Perryman died at Dunwich in 1882, followed by Jane's death in 1886. From 1865, Queensland's paupers and undesirables were removed from Moreton Bay towns, where they were considered a nuisance and an embarrassment, to the Dunwich Benevolent Asylum on Stradbroke Island. It wasn't a place that people would go to unless they were desperate. Historian Raymond Evans described the asylum as the end of the road, a place of last resort. While Joseph Goodall wrote that the asylum's function was not to help the weak and crippled, but to hide them. The food was completely inadequate and often rotten or maggot infested. During the day, the wards were closed, even during winter, and inmates were forced outside where they were exposed to the cold and rain, sometimes dying in their chairs on the asylum verandas. A doctor could be fetched from the mainland, but inmates may have died by the time he got there, or he was unable, or the inmates alleged unwilling, to treat them. Re residents regularly complained that they were neglected, starved, suffered injuries and illnesses in unbearable pain, and were beaten by staff. My research reveals that 19 female ex-convicts and many more male ex-convicts, most of whom were unmarried, were residents of the asylum in the mid to late 1800s and early 1900s. 15 of the 19 women lie buried in unmarked graves, some with their ex-convict husbands, in the picturesque seaside cemetery at Dunwich. Finally, we come to the women who were not recorded in Moreton Bay's early court, jail or benevolent asylum records and have therefore been the most elusive. While some have been traced by local historians or academic researchers, others have only come to light through genealogical research by descendants. Ticket of leave holder Jane Burnside and the convict Joseph Ray, who had been transported for life, were married in Camden, New South Wales in 1843. Research by a descendant, Jan Bimrose, has established that by 1852, the couple and their young children were living in North Brisbane. The family moved to Kangaroo Point in 1854, then west of Brisbane to Drayton, back to Ipswich, and later to Rockhampton, where Joseph died in 1866. Jane outlived her husband by 44 years dying in Toowoomba in 1910, just two days short of her 97th birthday, and having had 11 children, of whom three died young. Jan Bimrose travelled to Liverpool last year, seeking information about Jane's parents, Thomas Burnside, a tailor, and Jane Morrow, but drew a blank. Fortunately, however, while she was in England, she discovered that Jane Burnside's convict husband, Joseph Ray, was far from being just a house robber, as described in the indent of the Bussera merchant. He was, in fact, a highway robber and a member of the Birmingham gang. Joseph was sentenced to death in 1827, but while he was in Stafford Jail awaiting his execution, the Marquis of Lansdowne presented a petition to King George IV to extend the royal mercy to Joseph and another 77 prisoners on condition that they be transported to New South Wales or Van Diemen's Land. As Jan Bimrose wrote in her email to me, King George IV obliged and I get to tell the story. Thank you, King George. 
If you are familiar with my research, you will know that one of the stories I have previously shared is that of Caroline Haynes, who arrived in Sydney on the Buffalo in 1833. Caroline's story has come to light through research by descendants, including that of Barbara Baker, who has been kind enough to share photographs of Caroline with me, while other images have been shared by descendants on Ancestry.com. Caroline was tried at the Southampton Quarter Sessions in 1833 and sentenced to seven years transportation for stealing four caps, one collar and ten yards of cotton. Her first husband, the ex-convict Thomas Marsh, died at Maitland in 1845. Caroline then married ticket of leave holder Robert Schofield. In 1858, the Schofield family travelled by Bullock Dray to McIntyre Brook, about 100 kilometres west of Warwick on the Darling Downs. When her ex-convict husband Robert Schofield died in 1862, Caroline was widowed again. The youngest of her 12 children was four years old. Caroline spent the rest of her years on family properties at Purwell and Hillsborough before dying aged 89 at her daughter's house in Roma in 1907. The story of another Queensland female emancipist has been uncovered by Louise Westall Taylor, whose 2015 thesis featured biographies of 15 male convicts, including that of Edward Collins, who settled on Queensland's Darling Downs. Collins, who was transported to New South Wales in 1830, was re-transported to Moreton Bay in 1835 for two years on a colonial sentence for assault. After his return to Sydney in 1837, Collins married Margaret Lane, who arrived on the convict ship Margaret that year. In 1842, the couple were based at Scone in the Hunter Valley, but by 1852, Collins had purchased land at Warwick and commenced a cartage business. In 1863, Margaret died in an accident on a steep section of road halfway between Warwick and Ipswich. A report in the Toowoomba Chronicle stated that Mrs Margaret Collins, an old resident of this town, met an untimely end whilst proceeding to Ipswich on a bullock dray in company with a person named Lambert. On going down the range on the other side of Burdoffs, the wheel of the dray struck against a stone and the unfortunate woman was precipitated upon her head. She was taken up insensible and never spoke afterwards. Her grave now lies in the main range national park at Spices Gap. Signs record that she is one of up to 13 pioneers buried at the site and that the narrow section or pinch of road where Margaret died is known as Mother Collins Pinch. However, there is no mention of her convict past nor that of her husband who served two years at the Moreton Bay Penal Settlement and returned 15 years later to live on the Darling Downs. Lastly, we come to the story of Sophia Grantham, a bonnet maker, transported to Van Diemen's land on the Raja in 1841. So far, she is the only female Tasmanian convict I am aware of who made her way to Queensland prior to 1859, though I should point out that my master's thesis details another 11 female convicts from Van Diemen's land who arrived in Queensland after 1859. One of these women, Margaret Reardon, who was transported to Hobart on the ship Maria in 1849, didn't move to the Darling Downs until 1910, before dying there in 1915, aged 83. As revealed by Trudy Cowley and Diana Snowden in their book Patchwork Prisoners about the women transported on the Raja, the unmarried Sophia Grantham had two children before marrying John Tregilgus, a mariner in Hobart in October 1845. The family sailed for Melbourne, where Sophia's son died in an accident. By 1855, the family had moved again and were settled at Taroom on the Dawson River, about 200 kilometres south of Rockhampton. In December 1860, John Tregilgus placed an advertisement in the Moreton Bay Courier seeking to defend his character. Sir, I wish to mention to the public at large how I came to this country. I came in the favourite sloop of war and was a second-class boy when Captain Croker lost his life at Tonga Taboo. I was married in Van Diemen's land to one Sophia 
Vizier Grantham, which was a servant of Parson Turner's and was married in the Wesleyan Chapel in Hobart Town by Mr. Manton. And if anyone can say that I am a thief and a robber and the worst character on the Dawson, let them prove it and not say the government will take such a case in hand. However, it was not just the public at large who took exception to the character of John Tregilgus. Cowley and Snowden write that Sophia displayed great strength of character in divesting herself of her husband and bringing him to court in Rockhampton. In fact, as reported in the local newspaper, she had a magistrate's order dated 25th September 1865 to live separately from her husband, and since that time she had lived upon her own earnings. Unfortunately, Sophia's health gave way in 1873 when she was only 52 years old. A few weeks later, her only surviving child, Ruth, died from septicemia following childbirth, leaving behind a husband, a newly born baby and five older children. Sophia, who was also known as Keziah, is buried at the Springshire Cemetery to the west of Gladstone under the name Keziah Trichilgus. In conclusion, I believe that the growing interest in convict ancestry, combined with the rapid digitization of previously unavailable or difficult to access records, presents historians and genealogists with an incredible opportunity to identify more of these remarkable women and discover the forces, events and people that will bring their Queensland stories to life. I am delighted to have been selected as a Harry Gentle Resource Centre Visiting Fellow and for the opportunity to contribute the biographies and family trees of convict and ex-convict women who were present in Moreton Bay between 1839 and 1859. I also hope to source images of these women along with those of their husbands, partners and children, as well as photographs of the places they lived and the places they died. In sum, a photographical and biographical memorial to these most ordinary of women who led the most extraordinary of lives will be created as a first step in more fully, sorry, more fully acknowledging the presence and genealogical legacy of convicts and ex-convicts and free settlement Queensland. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jen. Um, that was amazing. Um, it was really enjoyable, and thanks for, so much for sharing your research with us. Um, it just goes to show what an um, amazing bunch of women started this, well, continued with this place, and um, what a sort of deeply troubled past we have as well. We also have one question um, from Caroline. Hello, Caroline. And this might test you a little bit. Um, were James Davis and Sarah Davis married to licensed Victoria Williams related by any chance? Over to you to answer that tricky one. Um, thanks, Carolyn. Uh, no, as far as I know, they're, they're definitely not related. Uh, James Davis was born in Scotland um, and uh, Sarah Davis uh, was born in England. In fact, she was married and had four children before she was transported. Um, so I, I don't believe that they are in any way related. That is just a coincidence. But thank you for your question. Okay, okay so... Um Thanks very much, everybody, for tuning in, and I hope you come back with um, to QSA Talks again, and uh, stay tuned on social media so you can see what the uh, next events are that are coming up. Thanks very much.